Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Buckingham, and I'm the Managing Director of Spectrum Analysis. Uh, I'd like to also quickly introduce you at the start to Anubhav Tiwari. Hopefully he can put his hand up. He is our Chief Data Scientist and very much involved with a lot of the work we do with the fitness industry, gyms, Pilates, and other businesses in that line. So many times you'll be wanting to speak to us and you'll probably find you're talking to Anubhav very quickly because he's the guru on the demographics. Uh, just while I'm going to, before I jump too far, I will take you to our screen. And you may have seen the uh, motto I'm using now, which is hope is not a strategy. And I must say, I thank my friend Michael Hobday at 7-Eleven, who quoted that when we did a recent thing at the National Franchising Convention. So if all else fails, just remember hope is not a strategy. I'd also like to thank Dorianne Lyons. Dorianne will come on a bit further on as our chat manager, and she is... Uh, she and Sue Elson together are controlling the webinar for us. So the agenda I wish to talk about today starts off with uh, the 2021 census and what we can expect and when. Bit of a talk about ABS data and population forecasts. I'd like to explain to people uh, CIFA, Socioeconomic Index for Areas, a discussion on territories or exclusion zones, making strategic decisions based on facts and data. Then I'm gonna bring up, we've set up a web-based mapping system for uh, the fitness and gyms industry. And I'd like to walk you through some of the uh, things you can see quite easily and happy to just touch on things like uh, reasonable drive times and mapping. So to start off, I wanna talk about the data. In the census, of 2021 is going to come up soon. There is a census cycle, which tends to run in a five-year cycle. And we really find there is specific data that makes a lot of sense for gyms, health businesses, et cetera. And obviously part of that is the population projections, the CIFA. And we've even have a bit of an understanding of the relationship between gyms and CIFA. And when you understand what CIFA is, it'll make sense. So this was on the ABS's website today, and it actually says that somewhere in June 2022, they're going to release something. I'll explain that in a minute. A lot more data will come out in October. This is things where it's additional data and the employment data, and eventually the things like the CIFA will come out next year. And this is always very normal in a census cycle. So we always start off with census night, which was 10th of August last year. And uh, the, this major release they're talking about is the 28th of June. And above tells me it's really probably going to be the words and music and we'll hear Bernard Salt and people singing about different things at that stage. But the really big data package we're looking for will come out around mid-July. And that's when we'll really get down to SA1s, SA2s, postcodes, and actually be able to talk about hard numbers. The ABS also put out a population forecast. And again, in the cycle, the five-year census cycle, this normally takes till about two and a half years to come out. And what it was, it came out in October 2019, and it actually tells us by age group, by gender, what is the population estimates from 2017 to 2032? Now that's incredibly valuable because if you're opening a gym, and you're now at 2022, we can see what the ABS said, they believe the population would be by 2022. And then we can see what it's going to do out to 2032. So that's as far as the ABS are actually prepared to go. They're not prepared to predict out to 2045 and things like this, because quite simply they say, we don't know that far ahead. So we find it really handy to work with this data and because it's at gender and by age group, we can do things like how many females are expected from 25 to 50 year olds for Pilates type of businesses are going to be in a specific area. 
So this data, of course, is Australia-wide. If we have anybody from New Zealand, we do have similar data, but their census cycle is out by two years to us. So when they do a census, we start off with SA1s. So there's 50, 000, 57,000 of the little blighters that average about 400 to 800 people. So this will normally be a couple of blocks around your house, and uh, it gets very detailed right down to how many people are there, what the average age is, what the number of people pay rental, whether they live in uh, freestanding dwellings, apartments or townhouses, all this sort of data comes out at SA1 level. SA1 then congregate to SA2s. So there's 2,310 SA2s across Australia. And to give you a comparison, there's roughly two, or there is 2,630 postcodes. Now, in a lot of cases in metropolitan areas, the postcode and the SA2 line up. But when you get to regional areas, it might be somewhere in outback Western Australia where uh, they want to call it one SA2. It may have 20,000 people in it, but it might be half a dozen postcodes, just simply because they're in small towns each with their own postcode. So in most cases, when we look at things, the SA2 and the postcode for general feeling uh, the same or uh, near enough. But when we get down to having to do territory planning, things of that nature, we actually like to use the very clear Australia Post postcode boundaries because that's what the postman's going to deliver the letter to. So from our 2,310 SA2s, we see 360 SA3s. I think it goes to about 109 SA4s and then they do it by state and eventually all of Australia. So that's the way it sets up. And just for interest, there's roughly 8,000 suburbs across Australia. So most postcodes probably have four or five suburbs in them, but you can get cases where it's literally one suburb is the postcode and other cases where it's 25 suburbs because they're small regional areas to make up one postcode. So when we get to doing territory planning, we're very much about using postcodes because that's the, everybody knows where they live. They probably know their own postcode. Now, I will talk a bit further on about CIFA. And CIFA is Socioeconomic Index for Areas. Now, if we ask you, how do you decide the socioeconomics of an area? One person might say the average household income. Someone else might say the level of unemployment. Someone else might say the average price of their housing. The very nice people at the ABS shuffle this together and come up with a score for every area in Australia. Every SA1 in Australia has a CIFA score. Now, Mr and Mrs Average in Australia live at a CIFA score of 1,004. I think when it was first done, it was 1,000, but a bit of weighting changes. So one standard deviation to the good side. So here's Mr and Mrs Average living here at 1,004. One uh, deviation to the good side is 1,100. Two standard deviations is 1,200. And if you're living out in, uh, I'll say, Bellevue Hill or Mosman or Vaucluse or Canterbury or, or not even Canterbury here in Victoria, but a couple of places get out to this, and it might only be for the SA1s, the very, very small areas. On the other hand, by the time the average of Sydney is probably more like 1020 or 1025 because average price of your houses, average income in Sydney is a bit higher than, say, Melbourne. It'll come in closer to probably 1,010. And by the time where Adelaide might be more like 980, just because the price of house and average household income. But when you get to regional, you're tending to be very quickly. Most of this is obviously outside the five main capital cities. And if you're, you know, living in a camp out the back of Mekathara or somewhere, you may be right down into here. But most of where we're dealing in capital cities, um, normally above 900, a little bit under that, and through to the very top end of your know, Vaucluses and places like that. So why CIFA is really interesting is when we talk about gyms and the fitness industry, you, it's a good proxy or a very strong way of saying who are our customers and where do they lay socioeconomically? Obviously, some very high gym that wants to charge $200 a week 
is not going to do very well in a low socioeconomic area. And yet when we do the types of the anytime fitnesses, F45s, things like that, they're probably very much across the board almost from uh, you know, the 900 right through to 1200. So often when we're talking for gyms and fitness businesses, we immediately get told we've got to do territories. Now, I'm the first one to say that, and in fact, I've written quite a few articles about do you have a territory or are you after an exclusion zone or is it a marketing area? Now, I'll just explain what I see as the difference. When we do people like Aussie Home Loans or Rams or something like that, their territory has to be exact. You're going to be really upset if you find out that you didn't get the lead because Spectrum or someone got it wrong and uh, Dorian got the lead and she ended up getting the $50,000 commission for the loan for, half, for $10 million because it wasn't exactly right. And that's why when a lot of businesses, we like to use Australia Post postcodes because that's fairly black and white. Even if it's one side of the road to the other, it's fairly clear of a major road, which one's in which postcode. Now, very few businesses like the fitness industry are exactly like that because you don't say to a customer, you can't come to us because you live on that side of the road. You've got to go to the other business. But what we're trying to do is make sure that at least if they call in through a call centre, that the right lead goes to the right business. Or it might say, look, you know, you're calling from this postcode, the nearest F45 or Studio Pilates to you is, is this one here. But what most businesses are looking for in the gym business is an exclusion zone. Because what it's really about is the franchisee is trying to say, I just want to be sure you're not going to open one in my backyard. And that's fully understandable. Now, the same logic goes into place, whether it's a territory or an exclusion zone. But I'd actually like to see in a lot of agreements, they talk about exclusion zones, because that's really what we're working with. Now, below an exclusion zone can be a marketing area. Now, marketing area might be, you say to the people, look, we want you to do letterbox drops. For now, can you cover this whole area and the next guy, he's going to cover this area and the next one's going to cover this area. But if a new site opens, then obviously that's not your exclusive area. It's not your exclusion zone. It's a bit further, a bit wider. And we're happy to do that to get coverage for now. So we do have businesses that often aren't franchises that say, look, we just want to set up marketing areas for where to drop off, as I say, drop flyers into letterboxes. It's an easy way to think about it. But most times in this business, it's really about exclusion zones. But we normally call them territories for the, the way of doing it. Now, what is reasonable for a gym? And I, I like to think of uh, three different types here. So what we're trying to look at is in a lot of cases, when we're doing a bit of logic, we'll actually say, let's map the customers. And let's say, if this was a 24-7 type of gym, we would probably expect roughly 80% of the customers to come from within two kilometres, because they can. They probably live nearby. Obviously, if it's in a CBD or something, that's a different ballpark. But normal middle metropolitan, you'd probably expect to get about 80% within 2K. Now, why I'm showing this is we always get the C word, cannibalisation keeps coming up. And it's very easy for a franchisee. And I remember I often quote Chris Malcolm, who's a guy who started being huge in Clark Rubber for 40 years. He said, Peter, we can open a new Clark Rubber in Alice Springs and somebody in Sydney will still complain. And it's true. And we often think, we hear very often people saying, oh, you know, if that business opens, it's going to take 50% of my business away from me. Well, quite honestly, that's normally bulldust. And what you find is if you've got the typical picture like this, then, and that's at a two kilometre radius, just as a really simple way of getting some metric around it. You could probably have another one three and a half or three kilometres away. And when you're at school, you probably did Venn diagrams, so you get a common area. And as you can see, sure, they might share 5% of the customers between them. And, uh, yeah, whoever wins that part of the war, who cares? But the point of it is 
too often people will have a gym and they'll say, oh, you know, we can't put another one for 10 kilometres or 20, 15 kilometres. Where obviously if you're a 24-7 type of gym, which is all about convenience to 90% of the time where you live, it probably is best part of 80% come from within two kilometres. Now, when we go to a high impact, a hit type of gym, we tend to see it a bit different. So this is your F45s, your body fits, your many of the different types of things. Now they're probably, again, law of averages can be very dangerous, but probably will get about 70% from within three kilometers, a bit more about, you know, I wanna to go to that type of gym, I'm prepared to drive a bit further whatever they're going to do or because they're super fit, they're going to run the three kilometres before training and run home again. Um, that's why I go to a gym that's about 400 metres from my home because if I walk down there, I can stagger home. Uh, at the end of the day, you'll normally see more like that uh, type of pattern of 70% coming from within about three kilometres. And when you go to the sort of full service type of gym, which is more about personality, one-on-one -on -one type of uh, training, you're more likely to see a set of rules like 60% probably come from within five kilometres. Maybe there's more people coming because they work nearby, they like the service. Obviously, probably it's an older demographic than the younger one, and it's obviously more expensive. So you might see something roughly like 60% within five kilometres. These are just some generalities we've brought up for now. But it starts to give you some thinking about if I'm going to lay out a network um, and you might remember my first slide saying hope is not a strategy, then you can actually map out your existing customers, come up with a few rules that, rules that you're going to follow and actually have a logic that you can say to your franchisees, like we've actually done this sort of research and based on this, this is the reason why we're going to have 200 across Australia or 400 or, yeah, you're right, we're only going to have 130 across Australia, which normally is the rough number when you have about 100 in the five main capital cities and about 30 in the sort of Canberra, Hobarts and everywhere else across regional Australia. Again, it's very easy to do once we uh, get and are able to map your uh, the customer. Now, the other thing we've found that's very good recently is we and believe it or not, this comes out of Berlin, is uh, drive time. And we found a company that allow us to be able to put a three-minute drive time, a five-minute drive time, et cetera, on any area. Now, why this is great is it actually follows, it literally must have some supercomputing power because it literally tracks out along each road how far it thinks it would get. Now, it's got some averages in there, and we believe it probably says a major road like Canterbury Road's on average doing 40 kilometres an hour or 50 kilometres an hour. A side road is more like 40 kilometres an hour. And by the time we're in a suburban street, we're more like 20 25 or 30K. But we find this really interesting because even an area like that, you'll find it's hard to get into. You've got to, it's smart enough to say you'd have to come up here to get up to here or down here. There's very little crossover. By the time it got to this space, it would be five, you know, five or three minute drive time because you can't just go straight across a railway line, which happens to be just beside our office. This is where our office is. So we find this sensational because it also follows down freeways. It obviously works on a freeway at doing about 100 kilometres an hour. And then it tracks off in at each time you've got an exit point. It works out how much further you will get. So a lot of people talk about drive times and I've always found that fairly fictitious is what they do, but this is the first time we've found something we really like. So that's the same area with a three minute drive time in one color, then a five minute drive time in another. And we can set it at five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute. In fact, a school recently had us do it at 45 minutes because they wanted to know if they ran a bus out into a certain area could they go and have a bit of a fight against another school? But it's very flexible to be able to do what we want. Okay, so as I said, hope is not a strategy. What I want to talk about now is strategic network planning. I always say you can be either proactive or reactive. Now, if you're proactive, you're actually saying, 
These are the areas we should be thinking of going into and we'll follow a logic. So if somebody comes and says, I want to go into an area you think, look, that's really not where we want to be, well, not at this stage of our development, then it's in your own interest to say, look, we hear what you say, but we think these areas are the ones we should be going into now and eventually where you're saying might be three years down the track. So when I say proactive or reactive, I like to think about it and what we do with people is work out and say, well, these are what we'll call your tier one sites. So you might say to us, I've got 40 sites now. We want to open 10 more sites a year. Well, maybe we just say, well, then, and we're mainly concentrating. We've done a lot in Melbourne or Sydney. We really should be thinking of the other markets. We've only got a couple there. Well, it might be that the next 10 sites should be more about where you're not at the moment. Then the tier two are the next lot after that, then tier three after that. Nobody's so arrogant to say, look, you must take that corner and just have to have a 10-storey building sitting on it and you think you're going to knock it down. It's never going to happen. But what we're trying to do is say, look, let's have a proper logic about how we lay out our network in time. So some franchisee coming to you saying, I really want to go with one of your sites. I want to open one of your gyms. We can say, well, look, these are the areas, the next set of areas we think we should be working on and not just because you happen to live in an area that's not conducive to what we're wanting to do, that you want to automatically think you've got the right to open in that immediate area. And too often I find businesses, and look, I can understand the first few times a franchisee comes at you, but by the time you've got 20, 30, whatever, you really don't want to be reactive. You hopefully have got enough uh, enough going with what your business is that you can be proactive and say, no, we're not just going to do it because you think it's a great idea. So strategic network planning is about area identification. I like to say we aren't in site selection that much. We, I like to often use an analysis as so you're in the First World War, there's a barrage balloon sitting up above and I'm sitting, or we're sitting up in the balloon saying, hey, they're coming from here and they're coming from there and we need to defend over here, whatever we've got to do. And there are people on the ground, the guys with the guns, and uh, they're the ones that are doing the, the hard work, the defending. Well, they're my equivalent of being the leasing agent. Firstly, your own leasing person and the leasing agent from all of the real estate agents around. They've got to have that hard fight, no argument about it. What we're all about and strategic network it's about is saying, well, that's where you want to have the fight and they're coming from here and these are the areas that are going to grow greatly and this area is stable and it's not the right type of people. Once you get that sorted out, then let the, uh, let the dogs off the chain and let them fight like they want about getting the actual site. But when you get to doing that, you don't want to just find out that you're, you're leasing person and the leasing agent's they're still just working on wet finger in the air approach. Now, many of you may know I came from Caldex for 20 years. Uh, obviously, oil companies didn't just decide to pick a site and go, oh, that seems like a great idea at the time. So all oil companies and 7-Elevens and all these sort of businesses have a logic. And the logic normally is that they will analyse their own network, <clears throat> have identified the drivers, say, why are our good sites good and why are our crummy sites not so good? Let's turn that into some rules or a mathematical equation to say, look, we take into account the number of people living nearby, the CIFA of the area, uh, how many direct competitors we've got, maybe our visibility and access, all sorts of things that come up. And that's really what site selection is about. Now, we can help do that, but we're not going to go out there and kick the dirt and do that for you. But it's great when you've got your people all on board where they're agreeing with the set of rules. So it could even be, you might say, we don't want to do any more in shopping centres. We hate the fighting with Westfield. We hate paying their big rents. We're going to be in shopping strips. Well, you don't want to find out that your agent working for you in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne is still running around looking for shopping centres. You go, no, we're beyond that. We're going for shopping strips. Well, let's have some rules worked out of what type of strips we want to be in. Do we want to be in the middle of the strip or we are more of a destination type business, so we want to be near the end of the strip or just outside it. 
then the things where you can actually build some <coughs> sales prediction tools that start saying, look, based on these factors, we expect we should get 300 members in that uh, gym or we, gee, it should be fantastic. We should get 600 or, hey, this looks like it's going to struggle. It's only likely to get 150 or 200 or whatever the, your numbers are because there is some formula about it. So we're very much about have a process to approve new locations. And we're not saying the strategic, uh, sorry, the model has, is perfect, but I always say to people, and I take it back to my oil industry stuff, was you may find a site and like a site and the model might like the site also, two ticks, you're a fair way down the track. You might find a site and say, that looks great. And then the model runs and it goes, no, nah, don't like that. Now there's nothing to say, your business can't overrule it and say, well, actually, we think it is so great, we're going to go ahead anyway. But at least it makes you ask a couple of questions. And it might be, look, we sort of lost the track, but actually the socioeconomics of that area really is not what we want to be. Or, gee, we forgot that there's three more competitors have come into that area that we hadn't noticed, whatever. The point is when you like it, when you like it and the model doesn't, it can make you ask a lot of questions. And Finally, you decide. We used to say probably at Caldex, you know, 30, 40% of the final decision was the model. Uh, it supported our views. But then you can get time where you say, well, let's just go and run the model on a whole lot of different areas. We might not even have a site there, but let's run the demographic parts of the model. They might be that you want to go into shopping centres. Uh, you decide you want to be the small gym in the lower end of a big shopping centre. Well, we can run the model on all those shopping centres and what that might do is say, gee, you know, out of the 20 shopping centres we ran, 18 of them were no good or you're already in a lot of them. But here's three or four that actually modelled quite well. And often the reply is, oh, oh, we hadn't actually thought of those or we didn't know they were that size. So, yeah, we'll go back in and have a look at them. And obviously if the model says it's crummy and you didn't like it anyway, well, that becomes a very easy decision and get on with life and move. But what we're really trying to do with having a site selection tool is minimise the risk. Now, we've been involved in a couple of, uh, not us, but been expert witness in a couple of these horror cases where a uh, franchisee reckons that uh, you got put into a dud site and the franchisor says, well, you're the worst franchisee you've ever seen. And that goes to court. And all I can say at that is having been an expert witness, it was never our client as such to start, inevitably we'd say, well, was there something done to have a, a sales tool or some modelling done or some logic? And the ones that have gone worse was, oh, no, um, you know, the franchisee wanted to go there and we thought it wasn't too bad and we let it happen and it all deteriorated, as you can imagine, from there. So very much about actually having tools that you can work with. Now, as well as having the tools you can work with, I'm wanting to show you in a couple of minutes' time an actual example of a web-based mapping system. But let me just say online web-based mapping system, we use a system very much called Mango Maps. Now, Mango Maps is something that's quite cheap, $1,300, $1,400 a year, but it's a bit like having Excel. Everybody can put Excel on their computer, but it's the data you feed into it and the formulas and what your actual Excel spreadsheet does that makes it valuable to you or makes it just another spreadsheet that's not being used. The same goes for Mango Maps. It is what we put into it on your behalf that makes it a really great tool to work with. And I don't think I'm going too far. Some people here could be from F45. We run F45 mapping worldwide and we run it with Mango Maps. So it is a great tool that helps you be able to see and move and do things with it. Now, obviously the first thing you can do is visualize your network. You can put multiple layers in. You may have a idea along the lines of you mark your territories as sold, available, reserved, no-go zones, whatever you wish to do, but it can be done and be flexible to meet what you want to do. So I'll give an example in a sec, shows competitors, can have all the shopping centres, all the shopping strips, it can have territories. I don't think the example I'm going to show you has territories, but very easy to fix. It can have demographics. 
graphics, like uh, what the percentage of, uh, I think the one I'm going to show you is imagining it's Pilates. So females 25 to 40 years old, 25 to 50, how many are in the area, can have population forecasts, can have the socioeconomics. So it's really aimed to be what you want to see. So bear with me one sec. Hopefully we're seeing a screen, ladies. Are we seeing a screen? Yes, we are, Peter. Yes, yes. thank you, Peter. Sorry, I need a confirmation. Okay, so let's imagine. Now, one of our guys, Jonathan, uh, <laughs> took, the, took the right and created Jonathan's Pilates, which, as I said to him, in the Pilates is normally fairly female-based, not trying to be sexist. He might not be the best way of selling his Pilates group. But let's say he is. So start off really simple. We have a, we can put in all of our existing sites. And what happens is you just click on it and it comes up with whatever data you want. Now we can have a very big data box in here about Jonathan's Pilates, if this is for Jonathan. It can have, uh, it could even have what the number of members are, what the members are by month for the last five years. It could have whether the Jonathan, whether the franchisee is left-handed or right-handed, whatever data you want to have, and you can give us on a spreadsheet for that site, you can have put in there. Now this is secure. This is running on a security system where you have the password to whoever you wish to hand it out to. Uh, I guess the interesting case is you can even have multiple passwords. F45 allows certain people to look at it but we're probably the only ones that can actually change it. And uh, they want to keep it that way because they don't want people in different countries saying, oh, we'll give you an extra suburb or an extra postcode. And next thing, it's out of control. A lot about this is version control. So this becomes the simple, best way you can go to know where all your territories and things are. So as I said to you, we could throw a little radius around uh, Oh, sorry, I can come in on this just using my mouse. I can come in close. I can come back out. So that's Jonathan's Pilates at Eastwood with a two-kilometre radius around it. I could put a five-minute drive time. I could put a 10-minute drive time. So in this case, as soon as I put the 10-minute drive time, we can start to see that, you know, they've got a fairly strong area reach. Now... We can also, we've got all the competitors in here. So let's start, there's all the KX Pilates. I need to see which this one is. Again, we can put whatever data we want in there. There's the one at Gladesville, that's its address. Uh, we don't, at this stage, we could have its email, we could have the name of the franchise, whatever data is available, their phone number, if you think that's relevant to you. We can even have, I'll give an example here, there's every F45 uh, right through to, uh, well, just where the address of each one is. So, demograph, uh, sorry, competitors, no problem. Now, you might be a business that want to know about shopping centres. So, again, we've come in hard. I'm using Sydney here, but this is actually set up Australia-wide at this case. Now, I can tell by looking at that 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 is actually a major regional shopping centre. Now, I don't know what you people know about shopping centres, but the way shopping centres work uh, no, sorry, it's probably a super regional. It is a super regional. Shopping centres, if they're over 80,000 square metres of leasing, it's called gross leasable area retail, over 80,000, they become a super regional. Then they're a major regional, it's 50 to 80,000. Regional is 30 to 50. Sub regional is uh, 10 to 20,000, 10 to 30,000. And neighbourhood is the small under 10,000 square metres. So I can very quickly use this <coughs> and go and look at any shopping centre I want in terms of what is its uh, gross leasable area retail and what is its moving annual turnover. Now, anybody who's got a facility in a shopping centre will know they normally have to declare every month how much turnover they've got and the very nice people sort of at the Westfields and things, put that together and start talking about it. So very much you are able to look at things like the gross leasable area retail and the moving annual turnover. You only have to divide one by the other and you very quickly get 
a metric called dollars per square meter. And when you look at this one, okay, that's going to be about $5,000 per square meter. If I walk us over to uh, here's Bondi Junction for all you Sydney siders, it's one of the biggest. So it's got uh, 97,000 square meters, $1.1 billion. Well, you only have to divide one by the other and you'll come up with probably near $11,000 per square meter. So you start getting a feeling of what's the dollar per square meter. Manly Warringa, again, 741.1. That'll probably be about $6,000 per square meter. So it's a great way of sort of finding out which are the really powerful shopping centres and which ones are quite strong. If I walk us down to Melbourne, I could pull up Chadston. It will probably be the highest of all shopping centres. So we can very easily have it so that if our gyms want to open in shopping centres, we can see where they are. Behind that is what we'll call strip locator. I'll need to come in a bit here. But we have gone through and used a metric to actually measure every strip of, I think we've got 700 in here. And I'm looking at this one now because I've never seen it in my life. Hampton Road, Artarman. And we can put a lot more data in, like approximately how many uh, businesses are in that strip and get a bit of a feeling for it. Now, if I go to somewhere like, that take me into uh, Northbridge, you can see the strip is actually tied up by us being able to geocode and spot a lot of businesses along that area and actually line it up and say what sort of, well, Sailors Bay Road. It will have a colour stream here. Blue is probably a number four. The green is probably a number five. And then we go down to a number one, but we can easily put that metric and the numbers on it. So again, if we want to look and say, we want to go on the shopping strips, we can have some metrics in there to look at to say which ones are the better strips and which ones aren't. Now I'll stick with my Sydney work here. I know if I go down to uh, Cronulla, it's Cronulla. Yes, it's a green, it's one of the, the top ones. So there's our metric on Cronulla. Carrying bar is another one. Again, we can even bring two things up at once. We can have the strips, throw up the shopping centres and start seeing, well, okay, Cronulla's mainly a strip with a small shopping centre. Uh, here's Miranda shopping centre. It has a strip out the front, but the shopping centre is probably the most powerful. It's a, a super regional shopping centre and there's a strip on the road in front of it. We even have marked in here bulky goods centres, markets, uh, different types of outlets to give us an idea. Let's say we did want to go into a, uh, a bulky goods centre. And, you know, I've seen a lot of Fernwood Fitness and things like that in bulky goods. Uh, we can actually get a metric to have a bit of a look and see where the bulky goods centres are. Now, this was all about demographics and I'm wanting to come up onto that now. So first thing I like to look at is population growth. And I'll stick in Sydney, but this is actually set up to be anywhere in Australia. So what we're seeing here is the highest, this dark blue, is the areas of highest growth. Now, every five years, we have that census cycle. So I'll start off in 2016. We had a census night in August 2016. Data came out in the middle of 2017, and then it takes a year or two, but by the time the Department of Health gets annoyed and frustrated, they finally say to this Prime Minister, would you go and tell those rotters at the ABS, you need to give us some population predictions so we can look at where we're gonna put hospitals and super clinics and all this sort of stuff. So that came out in October, 2019. And what it is, is population projection by area, and they've done it at SA2s, like postcodes, by gender, male, female, and how many naught to fours, five to nines, 10 to 14s, 15 to 90s, right through to 100-year-olds. Now, we use this a lot because we do a lot with schools, but the same logic applies. Obviously, schools, we're looking at five to 18-year-olds as typical of a school, and obviously, if it's a pure boys' school or a pure girls' school, we're looking at the boys or the girls. But to give you an idea, some of these high growth areas like 
I'm here at, uh, this one is uh, Homebush Silverwater. I've just set this up for now where we're looking at what was the population estimate of that area in 2020? What is it in 2025? What should it be by 2030? Now we can run that to 2032. And Jonathan has done a bit of work on this for me and he's set up what is the population increase from 2017 to 2032? And what is the actual population number that's going to increase? So from 2017 to 2032, it's expected to grow by 24,000 people. Now, that actually is not considered the biggest type of thing. If we come up here, I'm using my Sydney examples, and I'll give you Marsden Park. Now, Marsden Park Riverstone is actually going to grow 67,000 people from 2017 to 2032, or 310%. So maybe it's not ideal for a gym, i.e. socioeconomic, but the growth in it is phenomenal. And we've done a lot of work on where these high growth areas are. Now, Jonathan's theoretical gyms, not bad. Areas like here, he's looked it up, which is uh, Strathfield. It's going to grow by 22%. Uh, just above his gym is going to be Concord. It's growing by 43%. And here is going up. Sorry, I'll just pick that one. So we can get a good feeling that if it was a gym type position, you could very easily see what's going on around there and what areas are of high growth. Now, why this is set up Australia-wide, we can go over to areas like up on the, uh, that's the Manly Peninsula, but let's just take us up onto the central coast of New South Wales. So some areas like here, we're coming to King Cumber area, it's only going to grow by 13% over the whole 15 year period. So the growth that's sort of going on on the central coast is not all that strong. Maybe a couple of areas are 19% and Newcastle itself. Well, you'll find there's some areas out on the outside of Newcastle that are growing and this one here. So you can very quickly get, so it's going to grow 90%, it'll grow by uh, 14,000 people, probably not a bad opportunity sort of area on the outskirts of Newcastle. So we can be very general in that. And just while I'm there, because they do it at SA2 and then SA3s, the SA3s, we have to do stuff for education quite often. The government like to talk in these bigger SA3 areas. So again, Jonathan set it up for us so we can just quickly look at some of these SA3s. Gwinjelly, well, you don't have to know that uh, the new airport is going there, obviously, and it's expected to grow by 107,000 people. The SA3 down below it, again, Wallandilly, 32,000. This little one in here, which is still huge, Camden, uh, going to grow 36,000. But you get the feeling that these are the big growth SA3s. And then you can just as quickly look down and break it down into the SA2s for any specific area. I'll just do that to show you what I mean. So if that's our SA3, you can see the area there. I can just, oh, sorry, I'm gonna bring up the SA2s. The work, and it would have been a couple of SA2s went to make up the SA3. Now, we can even be more than that and go in Let's imagine where Jonathan's Pilates, he's very much about his ideal is uh, female age 24 to 45. Not trying to be sexist or exclusive, but I think a Pilates studio would probably agree it's probably a bit more female than male. And we can then start looking at an area uh, near where his Pilates studio is going to be, or where his current one is here. And we can just as quickly say there's 25,000 people, there's 4,700 uh, 25 to 45 year olds, and that's expected to increase. Uh, that represents 16% of the population. Another area might be here, I'm looking at the darker brown, it's 17%. It's actually expected 5,349 females of that, uh, of that group. And he's also set up for us just as quickly percentage of females in the area. And he's also set up for us population densities. So if we're just looking at where's an area of high population density, 
as you might expect, uh, the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Very quickly, are areas that are at about 7,381 people per square kilometre. And whereas if I'll come back out to somewhere that Sydney's obviously fairly dense by comparison to even Melbourne and others, I get out to here, I'm starting to look at 1,200 people per square kilometre. The purples are more like 3,000 people per square kilometre. And when we get into the higher ones again, 7,000 people per square kilometre. Just a good starting point. Now, I touched on CIFA, Socioeconomic Index for Areas. Where is the higher socioeconomic and where is the lower? Now, if I was running a gym that is full service, I'm probably going to be aiming for the top two. You can see the highest is that group, next highest, then then down to the lowest. Now, Sydney, because on average, it's CIFA is highest, it will have more of the dark blue, quite a good amount of the light blue. Some of the white, as you can guess, are in the sort of uh, southwestern suburbs. And then some, of, some more of the pink, and then eventually some of the red. But there's not that much of the red. How I, I said to you, this is very much Australia-wide. So I can just as quickly go and have a quick look at Adelaide, where I said the averages are, are lower. So by the time I'm in Adelaide, I might be starting to get a bit more of the uh, red and even the uh, more of the, the pink than I am probably going to see in Sydney. When I look at regional in general, we'll start seeing some more of the lower socioeconomic areas. Melbourne, uh, very much the inner eastern suburbs are your strongest blue, followed by your light blues and uh, your reds and things are more in the western suburbs. But again, if I'm talking a Pilates studio type business, uh, I'm probably looking for percentage of, high percentage of females, numbers of females in that 20 to 25 to 45 or 25 to 50, that probably covers 80% of my target audience. And I'm probably looking for areas of higher demographic. Um, I can, again, using this very quickly say, well, where are all our competitors? Where are the areas that I should be looking at? And then what we've actually done in this one, I'll just turn off a couple of areas, especially the CIFA. Jonathan's gone and said, okay, if I was going to have an imaginary business, where would I say are my tier ones? Where are my next 10 sites, let's say, across Australia? If I was going to be the one saying to the potential franchisee, this is where I think you should go. In Melbourne, he's obviously identified some tier ones. Then he's done some tier twos and eventually he's done some tier threes. And then after that, we start probably doing some more infills in other areas. I'll just bring us back to Sydney where we were sort of playing around a bit more. You can see how quickly I can just walk that up to Sydney, bring it up and there's Jonathan's tier ones, tier twos and tier threes as a suggested for a franchisee, for a franchisor in Sydney. And we've only made 10, 10 and 10 now. If you're a business that's already got 30 or 40 and you're wanting to look at where am I going to open the next 30 or 40, we would obviously work with you on that uh, and have some logic. So hopefully what you've got a feeling is, is that having one of these web systems makes your life a lot easier. Uh, we obviously, when we do a territory planning or exclusion zone planning for a client, we will have their territories all on there. And then we'll have this type of work backed up, including all the demographic stuff they would like to see. Because our aim is to make you, as much as we want to do your project about what your long-term strategy is and help you get sorted out, we want you to be able to go in there and look at these things. And if the CEO wants to know where's the best demographic areas in Perth or Adelaide or something out of, hopefully they can look that up at night and not annoy you if you're the business development manager. The funny part, I do a lot with schools and there are some schools where the headmaster who's obviously pretty demographic and data loves it. They grab this and they just, and most of the times the business manager or the people we're dealing with say it's fantastic because it stops the headmaster asking them all the crazy questions. So it can be very beneficial. So we're getting near the end of our webinar. Uh, I'll just, I think I'm almost the end of my slides. I'm sure the ladies will tell me I need to uh, 
bring this part to a head. So hopefully I've given you a good feeling of what the online mapping can look like. Uh, but what I just want to touch on is what value can we achieve? What are we doing to help you? We're trying to help people have an understanding of the available information today. And we're all about good business decisions. You know, as I said earlier, hope is not a strategy. Understanding and mapping where the current members come from. Have a realistic understanding of trade area or exclusion zones or whatever you want for your business. Identify your future growth areas and where to market and make the best business decisions based on facts and data, not your wet finger in the air. We are offering this set of slides to everybody who has registered today, so hopefully you'll do it, so I don't need to reintroduce myself, I hope. And uh, we do have a couple of upcoming events. We will be at the Fitness and Wellness Show, and in fact, we're happy to send anybody who hasn't got a ticket, uh, let us know. We can send you a free ticket through our uh, sponsorship that we're doing there. Love to see you there. Please come and see Anna, Barb and I. Uh, I've actually got to do a session. I guess I'll do a cut down of some of these slides uh, at 4.15 at that show. And please keep up to date. We're on a lot of places on social media, LinkedIn and things of that nature. So we look forward to uh, keeping in touch with you. And I'm going to throw it over to the ladies to deal with the questions. Okay. Thanks so much, Peter. That was terrific. And we've had um, a lot of people tuning in today. Um, although I've not seen um, a question come up um, in the chat. Uh, so perhaps now for those of you who are still connected, if you'd like to ask a question, um, unmute yourself or um, pop a question in the chat and we'll attend to it for you. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody unmuting. No, no, no one today. Any, Everyone's any being question, a bit shy. Everyone's being a bit shy today. Um, that's okay. If you don't have a question now, please um, always feel free to know that you can um, email Peter or contact Peter with the details we've provided um, in the chat and also um, in uh, the recording that we will send you. There will be the connection points there, either through um, social, uh, LinkedIn or directly emailing Peter. Also, um, we have quite a bit of resources and information on the Spectrum website um, for your uh, industry as well. Sue, did you have anything else you would like to add? You need to unmute, unmute yourself, Sue, sorry. I was being very she diligent earlier. <laughs> yeah. I know, I've caught. Uh, I was just going to suggest that if you found value from this presentation, you're welcome to write us a Google review. Just Google Spectrum Analysis or click on the link in the slides. Thank you. We appreciate any of that we can do. And uh, look, we're playing around a lot with uh, LinkedIn. I've probably hooked on to most of you people here. Please feel free to join us on LinkedIn. And uh, we're finding that a very happy medium for B2B type of work like we do. Okay. Well, look, uh, thank you very much for uh, participating. And uh, we will send it out soon over the next couple of days, probably later today. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.